welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, the first and longest running female hosted hunting podcast. When she's not arguing with boss hens or convincing gobblers that her box call is the sexiest, she's helping you navigate your trip of a lifetime. And now, he's your hostess, Carrie Zilka. This episode is brought to you by Cryptic, K-R-Y-P-T-E-K. I am in love with their new camo. I wore the Highlander bib overalls and coat while I was hunting down in Illinois and up in Wisconsin. And I can't wait to wear it this year in the cold weather because it really kept me super warm and I love the Highlander pattern. So it's brought to you by Real Avid. Check out Real Avid for all of your gun needs. They have a wonderful shotgun tool as well as lots of AR accessories. So if you're into guns, check out realavid.com. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast. I am your hostess, Carrie Zilka. And for today's episode, we have the president of the coolest fishing boat I've ever seen in my life, Ultra Skiff, Inc. Jeffrey Lizio is from Florida, and we're going to talk about fishing in Florida and his some of his favorite hot spots. And then we're going to talk about this fabulous boat that I am slightly obsessed with, because all the listeners know <laughs> how I get about my gadgets and toys. So, Jeff, thank Thank you you. so much for taking the time, and welcome to the show. Ah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Why don't we... So let's let's jump right into your favorite places to fish. So you're from the Clearwater area in Florida, which is cool, because I have not had anybody from the Florida area on the show in a long time, so it's long overdue. So tell me about the area that you're from and why you like fishing the area. Well, I'm actually from New Jersey. I'm from South South Jersey. Oh. Um, but I've been here in uh, South Florida now um, for you know, probably about getting close to five years now, uh, about the time that I started this uh, this whole business of mine. So um, I'm pretty well acquainted with fishing in both states, but uh, down here in Florida, the fishing is a million times better than New Jersey. Um, <laughs> can't yeah. compare the two. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but down here in Florida, it's just amazing. We have um, the, some of the best bass fishing in the world, and we also have probably the best saltwater fishing in the world. Is that so? Not to jump ahead, but is the reason mm-hmm. that you moved from New Jersey to Florida because because of your company? Yeah, it is. That's why that's why I came here. Um, okay. I came here first because there was a manufacturer here in Florida that I was working with. I don't long, no longer work with that manufacturer now. The manufacturer is in Texas, but I stayed here in Florida because the fishing is amazing, and I discovered early on that, you know, in order to organically grow this company, I'm going to have to come up with my own marketing materials myself. So it just made sense. Um, Florida just blows away every other state because, you know, I started this company with just a couple GoPro cameras. Like when you watch all those videos dating back all the way to 2014, when I started uh, filming in the Ultra Skiff, in fact, I started filming in the Ultra Skiff a year before we started manufacturing them. You know, back when it was just a prototype. So I had a huge head start on gathering material. So, you know, I just early on I was thinking, all right, how am I going to launch this? How am I going to get all this marketing material? And you know, it's either hey, you're going to pay professionals to go out fishing your boat, and you're going to spend a lot of money, or you you're, you're going to go out there and do it yourself. So the Ultra, the Ultra Skiff presented a unique opportunity where all I needed was a GoPro camera on a stand on the boat, and then I go out there and fish, and I document my travels and my experiences. I take that footage, I edit it, I chop it up, and I just keep stockpiling it, and then I put it together into great content. And that content has been responsible for, I would say, 99% of my sales to date. So it's definitely a good move. And uh, being, he, being here where I am, where I can fish both salt and fresh, then I'm able to gather two different types of marketing material one you know freshwater which is 90 percent of my market i you know i mean the saltwater guys maybe 10 percent of my sales go to guys who fish saltwater but you want that saltwater footage because you want to prove the product uh, in the saltwater you want to catch those giant fish that are going to get people's attention so even if they're freshwater fishermen it really pays to have that saltwater footage because it really grabs people's attention so that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's awesome. And we will definitely talk about your videos because I can definitely see how you can make that statement that a lot of the sales come from the videos because I, I promise you, I bet you I made my husband watch like six of them that night that I was like, you got to check this out. Well, 
well, the videos are I'll be honest fun. With you. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think I, the one thing I hear from everyone that buys a boat when they call me on the phone is, "Hey, so you're the guy in the videos?" I'm like, "Yeah, yep. it's me." Well, <laughs> I have watched every single one of your videos. <laughs> And I've been doing that for a few months, and now I'm ready to buy a boat. Yeah. And, I mean, that's the best. I mean, you can't get any better than that. I mean, that means that it works, you know. Um, people want to see the product used, and they want to see it in different situations and, and, you know, it makes them feel more comfortable, you know? They want to yeah. see you doing crazy things on the product. They want to see the product tested in different environments and with different sizes of people on it and different types of fish being caught. So, yeah, it was it's definitely the right move. Uh, go in the uh, bootstrapping organic entrepreneur <laughs> route that I did. That's so cool. So Thank let's you. let's step back a few years even before. What Have you always been into fishing? What got you into fishing itself? Um, I've always been in the fishing. Uh, when okay. I was uh, very, very young, um, I just loved fish. I would just doodle sharks and fish on every homework, you know, piece of paper or with crayons. I was just obsessed with fish. So, um, you know, my grandfather took me fishing when I was real, real young, and you know, we, we'd catch those little sunnies, you know, little tiny fish in fresh water with little pieces of bread, and I would just, I would just love it, you know. So I became just an addict for it, and that's all I wanted to do every day was just go down and go down to the pond. There was this little pond down the street where I grew up in, in New Jersey, and I could just ride my bicycle there with my little, my little fishing rod and some bread and some little hooks, and that's what I would do every day. I would just be there catching these sunnies every day, and then all of a sudden, boom! I caught my first bass, and then. It went from sunnies to bass, and, you know, that was like, oh, my God, I don't ever want to catch a sunny again now. All I want to do is catch bass. So I would still fish that same pond every day for bass, you know, just using worms and little, uh, you know, crankbaits and stuff like that. And and then, um, you know, that went really great until around when I was um, 12 years old. Um, there was this one giant bass that lived in this pond. And me and all my friends in the neighborhood would call this bass Bubba. That was his nickname, okay? He, he to us, he was 20 pounds, but in reality, he was probably about seven and a half. Um, but this bass, you know, you could never hook him. He would just show up, you know, every day you'd see him somewhere. You know, he'd pop up, there he is, there he is. And then one day, I'm running, I'm running a, a Rapala deep diver crankbait, and the pond was only four foot deep, so I couldn't actually run it very long. But I would just, it would sit on the top, and then I'd just take a couple cranks, it would go down two feet, and I'd let it slowly float up. And I would do that all the time, and usually catch one to two pound bass. And one day, it was a little overcast, and I'm running that same bait, and Bubba just shows up out of nowhere and just slams it to, right in front of my face. And there I am fighting this fish of a lifetime and i caught it and luckily i had a witness there i had my 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 one friend chuck was there and we didn't have a camera we never got a picture of it but i we i was so and you know chuck's like oh my god take it home mount it you know all this stuff and we're, we're kids but i had such a respect for this fish you know i let him go i let him go in the pond yeah but but I, I ended up writing an article all about that, and it got um, published in a local South Jersey magazine. In fact, the name of the magazine was called South Jersey Magazine. So they wrote an article all, all, all about that fish, and uh, it was a great memory. So you could say that. I mean, after that, after my childhood, I had fishing. Um, I was hooked for life. You know, I, 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 I couldn't shake it ever. So um, that's kind of how it all started. That's cool. So how did you come up with the ultra skiff idea? Well, the older skiff idea happened from fishing uh, in. I had a ten foot John boat with a trolling motor, and that was like my go to. And then I and then I had a fourteen foot uh, uh, fishing kayak. So those two things is, are what I grew up fishing out of pretty much my whole life, all the way into my twenties. You know, all the way through my twenties. That's still all I had was the kayak and the John boat. I I could never never really afford a boat. You know, I was living in apartments. You know, working in restaurants playing music for a living that's the other thing i did you know i played in a band so you know my my income level just never allowed to, me to have an actual boat so um and then right around the time when i was 30 all of a sudden i had a, a terrible injury believe it or not i sneezed one day and I, f 
fell on the floor and I, I herniated a disc in my lower back from sneezing. I'm not, this is can't can't make this up, but turns out like sixty percent of herniated disc comes from sneezing. Believe it or not, I like did some research afterwards, but you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it. But yeah, so many people in, injure their back sneezing. It's so so weird. But yeah, I mean I couldn't walk for nearly a year. Nearly a year. It it I couldn't work anymore. It was it was just it was just terrible. Rehabbing and Oh my god. It was it was nuts. That sucks. Now what now what led up to the you know, the generation of that disc in my back? I um I don't know. I I'm not gonna lie, I blamed it on the uh I blamed it on the uh, John boat and the kayak because I was always sitting low, I was hunched over hours upon hours and um there is actually a condition that comes from being hunched over on bench seats and, and being hunched down in a kayak and fishing you know, as much as I fished in my life, it may have had something to do with it. You know, I don't have proof, but that's kind of what I blamed it on. I blamed it on all all the years I spent sitting in those little boats. So I needed to, not only did I need a catalyst in my life to, you know, kind of, you know, like come out of the ashes, a new person, um, and maybe find a career, start a business, but I also had a real desire to come up with something better. Okay, why did I have those boats? I had those boats because I didn't have anywhere to store a big boat. I didn't quite have the money to invest in a big boat. And I really liked the idea of having a watercraft that was small and portable at the same time. So uh, that's where the Ultra Skiff kind of popped in my head. I'm like, okay, how can I, how small can I make this boat? I was like, six foot, that would be amazing. And then I'm like, okay, but it needs to be stable. All right. Hmm. Well, six foot wide, and I want the ability to sit up high, like as, as high as I want, and and that's where this cone shape came in around the chair on the deck, how it elevates to the edges of the gunnels, and um, and then I realized, wow, that has more, other than just letting you sit up high and giving your feet somewhere to reach, that has a lot of um, stabilization properties to it. Um, like when you're pressing your weight against it, your toes are elevated higher than your heels. And so no matter how far you try to lean over, you don't feel like the boat's tipping over with your body because the angle of the deck is going upwards. So your your central nervous system uh, is what kind of controls your equilibrium, you know, what makes you feel like you're going to fall over or you're imbalanced. And if your toes are higher than your heels, then your body is registering that as, hey, I'm okay. I'm standing uphill. I'm not going to fall over. And that's kind of the feeling you get when you're standing on the skiff and your toes are braced against that little ramp area. And the same thing applies when you're kneeling down. You kneel down in the skiff or you stand close to the edge. The skiff is going to tip that way. There's nothing you can do about it. But whether or not your body feels like it's going that way or you feel safe is dependent on the positioning of your foot. It's pretty complicated, but um, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a trained engineer. I'm just a creative guy, and I just had an idea, and I said, well, I think this is going to work. So I made little models of it, and then I made a full-size prototype of it. This is up in New Jersey. Uh, we did that through plastic welding. We had a big uh, plastic tank, and I cut it up into different pieces and glued it all back together. So I made a, a, a working prototype. Tested that out um, on a river in New Jersey, and I was like, well, you know what? This works. You know, my, my, my idea has merit to it. So that's when I decided to kind of go for it. And I, uh, I saved up money for two years. I uh, actually I did something that uh, I never thought I'd do. I, I moved back in with my parents at 31 years old. And I stayed there for two years and did nothing but work, seven nights a week bartending. And I just socked money away. You know, and um, next thing you know, after two years, I had like, I had like 40 grand in cash saved up. And uh, it was more money I ever thought I'd have in my life. But I was like, wow, I can actually start this business with this money. And that's what I did. So I, I used that money. I paid for the uh, first mold. And I moved down to Florida. And that's how, kind of how the whole saga started. That's crazy. That's quite the journey. Yeah. We, it's quite the journey. Yeah. <laughs> we own a condo. So we... I completely understand, and I can't afford like a forty freaking thousand dollar bass boat. I would love to, but even if I could, where the fuck am I going to put it? I have a, yeah. a, a condo 
you know? So, so that is one of the most appealing. Th- and we've thought about buying John boats and, and, or like canoes or whatever. But again, then you have to store it. And looking at something like this, I'm like, you know, we could rig something where you could like almost mount it on the back wall of the garage. Hey, now it yeah, seems, totally, you know, totally. it seems very space saving. And it's very space saving the way it stands up vertically, yeah. you push it up against the wall. That was the thing about it, you know, when you have to have a trailer um, with your boat, oh, man, that's what really takes up the space, you yeah. know. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah and does. too, I'm a, I'm a woman. I don't have the upper body strength that most guys do, so handling it by myself, it looked, you know, obviously it's going to be a lot easier to handle than trying to manhandle like a fold a boat or something. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's 123 pounds, so it can mm-hmm. be a bit much for your average uh, average female. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, but but there are creative ways, you know, there's hand trucks and dollies, and right. you can also roll the boat um, on, on its side. But, um, but yeah, you know, if it's, it's portable, but it's also not the lightest boat in the world. You know, yeah. like uh, just a normal John boat or, you know, another one of like those really thin, you know, flimsy um, plastic pond boats, yeah. the rectangle ones, they can be lighter than the Ultra Skiff too. Not all of them, but some of them can be a lot lighter. But the lighter you go with something this size, the thinner the plastic's going to be and the less durable it's going to be. Yeah. Especially since they're thermoformed mostly. When you get those real light flimsy ones, they're thermoformed and they have a... They have a um, a glued seam in the middle, and you know you hear about that all the time, where that seam begins to begins to start deteriorating, uh, you know, over the years, and next thing you know, it leaks, and the boat's ruined. But this product's really built tough, rotor molded, just like a big Yeti cooler, and it's uh, you know, it's it, it it definitely lasts. I'm still using the first skiff I ever molded, actually, still, oh, wow. still my baby, yeah. So where have you all taken your ultra skiff fishing? Like, what's the farthest away you've taken it? Well, one of the big tests we did back in uh, 2014, this was before we even started selling, was we took it 30 miles offshore here in the Gulf of Mexico. And there's a video of that day on our website. It was the first. We called it the we called it the offshore fighting chair test, and um, that was uh, that was that was like kind of the big big water test for it, you know. So uh, when we started out the day, there was like some legitimate three to four foot swells and we're fighting big amberjack in them and the boat was doing great we were so excited and then at the end of the day we got to tangle with the giant goliath grouper we didn't get them up but it was just great feeling a fish that big on the line and the boat didn't budge at all like it wasn't didn't tip over at all it had lots of power and leverage on the fish so that was a great test i i left that day feeling phenomenal about it i was just like wow this is great you know um, yeah. the boat i can definitely do crazy things in the boat now so um <laughs> but you know it has its limitations such as like going from the surf it's not a great boat if you're going to go on like some you know on a, off a beach with like big breakers mm-hmm. because those breakers are just going to come right over the boat you know and, and it may not tip the boat over but it's going to push it back so not great in that situation. I never actually tried it, but just looking at the science of it, I I don't think it would turn out well if you're you know trying to go th- through some really powerful breakers. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to be out there in swells, which move up and down, the boat's extremely stable. Like um, a lot of life rafts nowadays, like if you're on a on a on a, on a boat and all of a sudden, oh my God, we're going down! And you pull the trigger in the life raft, they're they're round, just like the ultra skiff. Um, they have great stabilization properties uh, when it comes to going up and over swells. So uh, that's the first crazy thing we've done. But then the following year, we did you know more crazy stuff. Uh, we teamed up with uh, Chew on this, which is a really popular fishing show on YouTube. And that's when we filled those giant shark videos. Mm-hmm. And so we, that day we caught, we actually landed a 250 pound grouper, 550 pound grouper, um, a 400 uh, pound bull shark, and a 350 pound bull shark. And then at the end of the day, I got in the skiff and I ended up catching a 425 pound bull shark. So we have videos of all that stuff. And the boat just performed so great that day, reeling, reeling in these giant fish. Um, so that was huge. And I mean, that definitely sold us a lot of boats and it's, no one's not going out there doing that. You know what I mean? No, but it was just, the, it was just the fact that it, it showed the boat in that type of extreme situation and how well it held up and how easy it was, you know, for the angler to, to, to fight the, to fight the fish because of the way that it positioned your feet and your posture and the way it put leverage on the fish. 
definitely a cool thing. Definitely a good thing. That's awesome. Yeah. I can imagine. So living in Wisconsin, we have the Wisconsin River and the Mississippi River and a lot of backwater sloughs that you can't get into, like if you had a bayliner or something like that. I think something like this would be perfect for those backwater shallow sloughs. Absolutely. I mean, this is a great, great backwater boat, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. When you want to get into that area, you know, that you, you know, a tight little area, something like that, you know, has a shallow sandbar where you just don't feel comfortable bringing your bigger boat. This is something where you can have that experience like you're sitting in a bigger boat, but in something small like this, without a doubt. It definitely has its place in the market, you know. Uh, some people are some people like the fish out of tiny boats. There's a sense of adventure in it. I talk to people about this all the time. Like, um, you know, some people, even though they have the money for a bigger boat, they just want something small. It's it's some it's one part of it's the challenge of it. The other part of it's just like this weird type of adventure you get when you're in something small, you know. It's, um, I guess it's more of a pure experience than sitting in, like you said, a $40,000 boat with all these electronics and gadgets and gizmos everywhere when, geez, you're just trying to catch this little fish, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Eventually, it gets, it gets to a point where it's like, hey, you know, are you going to war here or are you <laughs> trying to catch a fish? I mean, you know, our ancestors did it with a spear, you know? Yeah. And, and here you are with, like, radars and sonars and, like... <laughs> missiles and stuff like coming out of your boat and stuff like that and it's just like yo you know like where do you draw the line here eventually we got to get back to you know our roots right right so um yeah that's i think true. That's, i think that guy, yeah i think kayak fishermen small boat fishermen i think we can all feel a little pride you know i think nothing against the big boat guys you know but i i think that um i think there's definitely um we're kind of like the unsung heroes out there, you know. We're yeah. going out there, and we're doing it a little, a little closer to the grain, uh, you know, in the pure aspect of fishing. In my opinion, the purest fishermen are the shore fishermen and the wade fishermen. You know, they are. That's how it's always been done, you know. But then the next step are the small boat guys. You know, yeah. they're the ones. They're the ones taking the biggest challenge. And then after that, you know, comes the big boat guys. So, you know. Yeah. So tell me about <laughs> tell me about Alligator Lake. So you mentioned that that was your favorite lake to fish. And tell definitely, me why. Definitely. Well, Alligator Lake, I, I live in a very urban area here in Pinellas County, Florida. It's very popular. It's like a city. Okay, there's no rural land or anything or farms or anything in Pinellas County. It's um, it's very populated, and there's a ton of fishermen. So, like, when you go out on the weekends anywhere, it's just boat city, boats, kayaks, everything, just everywhere. It's just a ton of fishing pressure. It, it gets really frustrating to where you don't even want to fish on the weekends sometimes. That sounds pretty bad. But um, Alligator Lake, it's a freshwater lake, and there isn't a lot of – there's not too many freshwater fishermen uh, here in Pinellas County because we're surrounded by saltwater. It's basically an island. And, you know – uh, down here, being a saltwater fisherman is cool, you know. Hardly anybody bass fishes. But yeah. Alligator Lake is a, just a phenomenal bass lake. It, it has, like I was saying, it has all these different elements that make a lake phenomenal. It has an inflow on one end, okay, and it has an outflow on the other end, okay. So you got fresh water coming in, you got, and then you got the water leaving, and it's always flowing out. There's a dam uh, on one end where, it, where it's more like a waterfall. The water's flowing out into the salt water. And there's a river on one end where the water's always flowing in, so there's always fresh oxygenated water. The bottom the bottom of the lake has uh, varying depths. Um, you know, um, one end of the lake, I would say, is uh, between, uh, you know, three and seven feet. And then one end of the lake is between 16 and five feet. And there's bunch of big mounds and humps right in the middle of the lake where it'll just drop off like a cliff from five feet down to 14. Um, there's two fingers that are like coves and they're residential. So there's, they're lined with docks on one side and then overhang, overhanging structure, natural overhanging structure on the other side. There's two, two coves just like that. There's one, one cove where the inflow is where it's just all natural structure. There's no houses or anything on that end of the lake. And, um, and 
lot of big, beautiful lily pads all over the edges. Um, you know, lots of down trees um, along. It's just, it's just, be- it's a, it's a beautiful lake. The water, the water clarity is just about perfect. Not too dark and not too light. Um, and then my favorite thing about the lake is the bottom. Okay, the bottom of the lake is not weedy. It's not. There isn't hydrilla. There's no pepper grass. It's just bottom. Um, of course, there's some structure there. There's some cabbage. Uh, you know, they call it like cabbage grass. There's definitely a, some. Ca- I don't mind cabbage grass so much. You know, it's hydrilla and pepper mm-hmm. grass that really get to me. Um, the cabbage grass not so bad at all. And there's a ton of shells. The bottom of the lake is just covered in shells. Huh. There's so many freshwater clams in this lake and there are huge shell bars around the lake the bass love these shell bars these mounds of shells and they just accumulate on there but you can feel like when you're running a bottom crankbait you know and all of a sudden it just feels you hear like clickety clack as you're running the bait and it just feels like you're going over like you know like railroad tracks but it's really just your bait hitting all these shells and so so there's the, the bottom is just there's just shells everywhere. So it's just a very, very healthy lake. You can tell by the amount of shell, shellfish how how oxygenated and healthy the lake is. And then there's the population of fish. A lot of fish in this lake. There's catfish. I've caught catfish. There's a ton of tilapia. They're, but there's I've never seen a carp, which is great. The tilapia, not a great sign for the lake, but there are a ton of bass in this lake. Um, and they school up. Big giant school. I mean, thousands of bass in this little lake. And starting around right about now, right around May, they school up all the way till November. And every morning from 7 a.m. till about 11 a.m., these schools of bass will just be going crazy. I mean, really? they'll be you'll you'll be in your boat, and all of a sudden they'll just start jumping out of the water, just literally just. Jumping out, of the, jumping out of the water. It looks like it's. It looks like there's just a feeding frenzy on the surface. That's how many bass are feeding at the same time, and um, it's it's pretty tough because you really can't chase these schools. They move so fast. Like you, they'll just start. If you can cast to them, great. You're going to get one. You see them start feeding. You cast into the school. You run your bait through it. You're going to catch one. But if it's like 20 yards away and you can't make that cast. You can't chase them because once you get there close enough to cast it, they're done feeding and they moved another 20 yards somewhere else. And um, huh. it's funny. You talk, I talked to all the other bass fishermen on that lake, and you all say the same thing. Don't chase them because once you chase them, they end up right where you just were. <laughs> it's like they, they, they know where you're going, and they just want to annoy you. But the best thing you can do is to slowly meander around the lake, kind of maybe try to get a feeling for where they're going, and then hopefully – uh, cut them off, you know, like where they just, and it'll work, you know, you're just, you see them, okay, don't flip out, don't start speeding towards them, they're going to disappear for a second, but where do you think they're going to end pop up next, and then just try to be in that spot where they pop up next, and then cast right to them, and um, I've had a lot of luck, a lot of the fish I've caught has been uh, through these huge schools that just roam around, and most of the bass in these schools are around one to two, uh, one to two pounds, but down at the bottom of the school, that's where you'll get the you know five or six pounders, and um, I found a lot of luck uh, running running the deeper, heavier baits below the school. That's when I run into these bigger bass. But then the biggest bass of the lake can be found in the structure, in the reeds, in the toolies, um, in the overhangs. You know that's that's when you're trying to find the the bigger bass. So if you're going just going for fun in numbers, or if Let's say you've had an, uh, a rough day and you just want to catch something. That's when you start going after these school and fish. But, you know, if you're looking to maybe get that, that big bass over seven pounds, that's when you, you you pitch in tight to all this structure along the edges, and you just have to be really patient. You may only catch one or two fish the whole day, but they're gonna it's going to be a really good fish. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's it's the lake. It's it's the lake that kind of has a little bit of everything. I, I I've never fished a lake a lake like it in my life. To be honest with you. That's awesome. That sounds yeah, so cool. cool. It sounds so fun. It it's fun, it, especially in the skip. Because like I said, it's a perfect size for the lake. Right. You know, it's, 
it's not too big, it's not too small, and I can hit every single spot in the lake on one single battery. It, it's a great feeling. The lake gets a lot of fishing pressure. It does because, you know, if you're a bass fisherman in Pinellas County, you're going to fish that lake, you know, especially on the weekends. But if you can get out there on a weekday, it's, you got the whole lake to yourself, it's a blast. Absolutely a blast. You can watch a video of me and um, a kayak fisherman named Jay Nat. Me and him take two skiffs, and we fish Alligator Lake. That's a video on our website. So and if anybody wants to go and actually watch us, we nail, like, I forget how many fish, but <laughs> we catch uh, easily, easily 20, 30 pounds of fish in an hour um, on that lake in that video. So if you want to see uh, how crazy the fish are in that lake, you can watch that video. I'll link to it in the show notes so anybody listening can go right to the show notes, wwcz.net slash EP181. I'll link to some of the cool videos, some of my favorite ones. I'll definitely find that one. Talk to me just cool. briefly a little bit about um, some of the accessories that you could add to this gift. Because so for anybody listening, they might be thinking, okay, this is like a big saucer-shaped boat, but... Yep. It's hard to explain how cool these things are, you know, in an audio-based show. So tell us a little bit about some of the accessories that you can add on. Lots of accessories. Lots um, of them. You know, um, you know, they have these uh, four cleats around the seat, and the cleats are held in with molded threaded inserts, so there's, like, actual thread in the plastic that's, that's brass. So you can easily just unscrew the two machine screws and take off a cleat, and then you can add like external rod holders, guide mounts, stuff like that. But ram mounts we recently started using, and they're like these little little ball joint mounts. And the whole pattern on the mounts, we have a video on our website that shows you how to install them, fits right into those two threaded inserts, and you just screw right them right in there. And then with those ram mounts, you can. Geez, you can hold anything, you know, an iPad, a phone, um, fishing rods. they got all different types of rod holders, so they're really cool. And then there's the homemade accessories, um, PVC accessories. So it turns out that if you get PVC and you cut a few slits in the end of it, it'll pressure fit into the six molded rod holders around the boat. So from there, with just a little creativity, with just a little hand saw and some PVC cement, and some cheap PVC from Home Depot, you know, you can build all the custom rod holders you want. You can build a custom duck blind. You can build a GoPro camera stand. You can build a handrail. Uh, you can build a transducer holder. You can build anything you want. So the PVC um, thing uh, has been really, really cool, and it's kind of given people something to do with their time and energy, and it enables them to save money. They don't have to go out and buy really expensive name brand, brand products if they want to kind of trick out their skiff. They can just, you know, spend a little time in the garage and build something themselves. Um, uh, some other accessories um, on the front of the skiff is a little, we call it a tow ring, but it's a through hole right on the front. And you could put in a um, shallow water anchor pin right through that hole. That's been really cool. Um, depending on what type of fishing and what lake I'm going to, um, I'll, I'll, most of the time I will have that shallow water anchor pole with me. Uh, we use the Yak Attack parking pole. That's my favorite one because that one floats. And, um, you know, you never know when you're going to drop that thing in the water. So you definitely want to get one that floats. Um, and then on the bottom of the boat, we have these four inserts, uh, four mold, mold and threaded inserts. And uh, we call them utility inserts. And you can mount a magnet or a transducer to those inserts. So we put these little circle magnets from the hardware store on there, and then you can just get a bracket, uh, pull a transducer to that, and then stick that right on that magnet. So we put out a video called um, the Ultra Skiff Magnet Mounts. It shows you if you want to mount something like a water pump or a transducer to one of those magnets, it shows you how to do that. And then it goes to the seating. And now the seating is one of the best parts of customization. Um, and that's kind of why we sell this gift kind of blank. We don't include a seat or a seat system with it. Um, there's so many different styles out there. And, yeah, they all just hold a seat, but how high do you want your seat? Do you want the seat to be able to slide up and down? You know, do you want a round base or do you want a square base? I like the round ones better. I think they look so much cooler on the circular hole of the boat. Um, but, you know, it's up to the person. So I made a nice um, video detailing all the different types of seat systems, all the different styles of seats you can use. And I made, you know, if you look at the videos, a lot of the videos all have different seats and different types of seat systems in it. So you can kind of see, 
you know, as the person's watching all of our videos, they're kind of saying, mm, you know what, I kind of like the way that one performs. I like the way it looks on that one. I like the way that one's kind of set up. So the person gets an, an idea of how they want to set up their skiff. And one of the most gratifying things to me is when I see a picture, I always tell people when they buy one, send me a picture when you get it set up because everybody's skiff looks different, you know. Everyone's got a different color seat, different style seat, different height, different type of pedestal, and it's so cool. It's like everyone's got, like, their own skiff, you know. Everyone mm -hmm. has made yeah. kind of their own version of the product, so definitely like that. Um, to move on from customization, uh, let's see here. Um, people have started applying a marine mat and sea deck. That's like the non-skid surface. People started have started applying that to their boats this year. Um, started with the doors. You know, some people have put that cover over the doors, and now I see people putting it on the deck and even all over the boat. So that's been a cool huh. thing. Um, I'm trying to think what else here. And then there's, you know, the motor, obviously. Um, there's Motor Guide and, and Minn Kota. Both of them are good. I'm a little partial to the Minn Kotas. Um, and uh, I like the variable thrust when it comes to the motors. Uh, so much better than, than the non-variable thrust motors. So that's about it. Oh, and then, there's the, and then there's the rotational stabilizers. That's another invention of mine that I came up with because when I'm bass fishing, I'm not anchoring the boat. And that's the one drawback to having a boat that's light, especially a boat that's six foot long, is that it's going to change its direction pretty quick. You know, it's going to yeah. turn on the dime. It, it can be described as being a little slippery, you know, out there. But sitting in the center of something round, it definitely, that's one of the advantages, that if the boat begins to ambiently drift, like left or right, and when I say left, I don't mean like move left, I just mean spin, like like the boat's facing east and all of a sudden, like a second later, it can just spin and all of a sudden face southeast because it got hit with some wind or the barometer is shifting or anything can just make it kind of spin off its axis a little bit. It's great sitting in the center because you don't notice it. All you have to do is shuffle your feet to stay aligned. But when you're bass fishing, if you're slowly motoring from one spot to another, that can be an issue. So when it comes to just slowly motoring parallel to structure and shorelines, that's when I wanted to find a way to kind of stabilize that drift a little bit. And that's why I came up with these rotational stabilizers. They're made out of PVC. Could somebody make them themselves? I imagine so. But I do have a patent pending on them. You're welcome to try and make them yourself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you want them done right and you want them to look really cool, you buy them from me. Um, you know, huh. I do them in, uh, with black furniture PVC. I put a whole bunch of the fancy stuff on them so that they, they, they don't make any noise when they're on the boat, and they're really easy to take in and out of the rod holders, and they say ultra skiff on them, and they look really cool. And they break down in half so you can fit them into a small bag or inside the compartment. Um, so they're, they're definitely cool, and for bass fishing, they've been a huge plus for me. Um, and I've sold quite a bit of them to people. So if you're watching the videos and I get in here, you see these two weird black things on the side of the boat, that's what they are. Oh, cool. Yeah. So once people go and they watch a bunch of your videos and they're all fired up mm -hmm. like I am, <laughs> um, where where can they go to find out more about purchasing one? Are you in big box retailers or is it strictly online? Well, it's kind of a mystery because, like, <laughs> we don't have an online store on the website, okay? And um, But we we most of our sales are direct. I like it when people call me. Okay, or email me. I want to talk to the person. You know, one of the reasons for that is that these boats don't ship FedEx. You know, they don't ship UPS. They have to ship LTL freight, and the world of LTL freight is pretty. It's pretty complicated. You know. Um, yeah. I have to make sure that the customer is giving me a phone number that's the right phone number, and it's the phone number that works. Because if it's not, and this trucking company brings that boat to your house, and you don't answer the phone when they want to schedule the, the delivery, well, it's a disaster, oh, you know? Um, the, these trucking companies, they're not friendly, you know? Um, yeah. It's not like, it's not like UPS uh, where they're going to, like, leave a tag on your door and then come back tomorrow and try. No, you got one shot. And then that that boat goes back to that depot and sits there. Well, every day they're going to charge me $70 while that boat's sitting there, Okay. It's a completely different world than just shipping a package to somebody um, with this stuff. So uh, that's why I like to talk to somebody. I like to make sure that, hey, I have the right email or I have the right phone number. And if I give this phone number to the freight company, 
you're going to answer the phone when they call. And also, it gives me a direct line of communication with the customer, you know, yeah. um, to where, you know, if there's a problem or the boat's going to be late on delivery or, or you know, something happens that I can call that customer or that customer can call me anytime and, and we can find out exactly where that boat is and when it's coming and when it's being shipped. So it's definitely a better feeling. And the other reason I don't have an online store is I like to be very dealer-centric. So I'm trying to sell the boat through dealers. You know, I want to. I don't want to really want to be a competitor to my dealers. So this year was our first year landing a deal with a big box store. So starting uh, February of 2016, we, we, we've been selling on Cabela's.com. Huge step for the product. Huge step for me. So happy. And it, maybe if I had an online store... It may it may not have happened, you know. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm really glad that I made I made that move. So when people are kind of searching, where can I buy this online? Boom, they see it on Cabela's, and they can buy it. And uh, Cabela's does a really good job of the trucking and the freight, like I was saying, you know. So, but they're a lot better at it because they have such a huge network um, of of logistics. So. Oh yeah. And all of their customers, they have Cabela's accounts and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's it's much more managed, um, you know when it comes to uh, shipping LTL with them, probably better than I could do if I had an automated um, system like that. So that's why with me, if you want to buy a boat direct from me, call me and we'll work it out. We'll get that boat to you. But it does feel nice if someone else is going to sell this with an, through LTL and have it shipped to somebody, that it's a company like Cabela's or, you know, like a big retailer like yep. that who can Very deliver trusted. great customer service. Yeah. Very trusted. Exactly. Something like that. Exactly. So, cool. um, yeah, yeah. Very cool. And then, That's and then, exciting. And then we have a bu- yeah, it's, it's super exciting. I know. And then, like, next year they said that, you know, they're super interested in putting it in some of their stores. And that's, like, a dream come true, you know. Um, when yeah. I had, first had the idea, I was like, yeah, man, one day I want to see this product on the showroom floor <laughs> of a Cabela's or Bass Pro Shops, you know. Just to walk in a store and see something that I made sitting on that showroom floor would definitely be a dream come true. So I'm still working towards that goal. That would be cool. That would be so yeah, cool. Absolutely. It would be cool, I know. <laughs> That's awesome. You would like have just gone from start to finish with the all American entrepreneurial dream for real. I'm trying. I'm, I've been working hard, grinding real yeah. hard day and night. I mean, I I am worn out. I'm not going to lie. I need a vacation <laughs> bad. I really do. But, you know, um, when you see progress and you see growth, you know, year over year, month over month, you know, that just keeps you going, you know, because, yeah. you know, that, that goal, you know, it's you, you see it, you know, it's right in front of you. So, um, you know, you, when you're looking for that last bit of energy to keep keep going like a runner would in a race, you, you can see that finish line and uh you know there's no giving up now you know yeah. going all the way <laughs> <laughs> well tell the listeners where they can find what your website is and your social media channels sure um website is ultraskiff.com that's www.ultraskiff.com um you can find us on instagram at ultraskiff hashtag ultraskiff at ultraskiff same thing for twitter at ultraskiff Facebook, same thing, Ultraskiff slash Ultraskiff, Facebook.com slash Ultraskiff. And that's really um, that's really most of our social media. Um, we're on Pinterest as well, and um, Ultraskiff, obviously. Awesome. But, uh, yeah, that's that's it. But if you want to see our video gallery, um, you, know, you can go to our webpage, and right on there, front page, there's a button that says visit our video gallery. The videos are separated into three categories, instructional videos that teach you how to build things, demonstration videos that show the boat being demoed by different people or in different situations and then fishing videos that just detail all the different types of fishing all these it's almost like a it's almost like going to netflix for you know episodes of something yes. <laughs> you can see all these different yeah. types of fishing and then of course our youtube channel um and our, our video gallery is sort of an, a more organized extension of our youtube channel but our youtube channel is ultra skiff and um, if you, anybody can, please subscribe to that. Yeah, definitely. I highly recommend it. As you're going through, I'm like, okay, subscribe there. What's the next one? Subscribe there. Because I love your videos. I love the photos that you're sharing. You're doing a really great job with social media. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, cool, Jeff. Thank you yeah. again for Thank coming you, on the show. Oh, this this has great. been fun. I was, this, was, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate it. And this thank you for will... everyone. Every, thank you for everyone listening. Yeah. 
um, I'll make sure to link a lot of the links to the social media pages and, like I said, those videos, my favorite ones, in the show notes. And this will actually air, let me look, I think it'll air next Wednesday, May 3rd. So as soon as it goes live, I'll email you the link so you can listen to it and share it out or whatever you need to do. I would love to share it. Cool. All right, Jeff. Yeah. All right, Thank you so very much for everything. Yeah. You're welcome. Have a great night. And that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to find the show on iTunes. Just search for Huntfish Travel Podcast and hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on social media. You can find Huntfish Travel on Facebook, or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carrie Zilka, C-A-R-R-I-E-Z-Y-L-K-A. C-A-R-R-I-E-Z-Y-L-K-A.